And I want to approach this theme from a very different perspective. And I go back to our roots. And I say this, I dare say this, that I may have been brought up in a Methodist church and not yet a Methodist. I may be baptized by Reverend so and so. I may be a partaker of the Holy Communion, but not yet a Methodist. I may understand the standing orders, attend all circuit, synod, regional meetings. I may attend all the synod committees, but not yet a Methodist. Ionically, I may be an elected leader, understand the language of assessment, speak Kimeru fluently, but not yet a Methodist. Therefore, who is a Methodist? I read a small book that said Methodists are different. A Methodist is one who lives an ordinary life, a methodical life, a mission life in full reverence of God. A measured, methodical, figured out life in full reverence of God is a Methodist. A Methodist is a planner, an enthusiast, to use the words of John Wesley, a Bible moth, one who is boring and boring the, the word of God, looking every page and trying to figure out what God has said. A Methodist is as a nuisance to sinners, intolerant to sin in the world, but not of the world. A Methodist is a hater of chaos, a timekeeper, a disciplined person in every manner, a lover of hymns, devoted in prayer. A Methodist is one after God's own heart. A Methodist is a goer of an extra mile, a cheek turner. A Methodist is a narrow way person, a generous giver, a great citizen, a problem solver, a solution seeker. A Methodist is a sacramentarian, one who commits their life to follow Jesus through the pathway that John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, spelled out for us. And for this reason, John Wesley developed a criteria for self-examination of the people called Methodists. And this was done in every annual general meeting. The meetings that we call AGM, when we elect leaders, when we read those uh, financial statements, when we check the health of our church per year, there's one element we miss that was supposed to be done in an AGM, and this was self-examination. John Wesley developed 24 questions, and I will not spare you any of them. I will read these 24 questions, because we cannot say the righteous shall live by faith until we recapture who we are in the spirit of Methodism. Am I consciously or unconsciously cre creating the impression that I am a better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Number two, am I honest in all my acts and wants or do I exaggerate? Number three, do I confidentially pass on to others what was told to me in confidence or do I gossip? Can I be trusted? 
Number five, am I a slave to dress, friends, work, habits? Am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying? Did the Bible live in me today? Did I give it time to speak to, to me every day? Am I enjoying prayer? When did I last speak to someone about my faith? Do I pray about the money I spend? Do I go to bed on time and get up on time? Do I disobey God in anything? Do I insist upon something about which my conscience is uneasy? Am I defeated in any part of my life? Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, distrustful? How do I spend my spare time? Am I proud? Do I thank God that I'm not as other people, especially as the Pharisees who despise the publicans? Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold her resentment to us or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? Question number 23. Do I grumble or complain constantly? And question number 24. Is Christ real to me? The more I ponder about this introduction, the more I struggle with the question, even as I wear these robes before you, am I a Methodist? The more I think about our Methodism and the people called Methodists in this generation, the more I see how much we have fallen from our original pursuit. John Wesley desired that any society of the people called Methodist would be a society that was purified, would be a society that was after God's own heart, would be a society that was honorary, and the people called Methodists themselves would lead the way in showing and exhibiting the competencies of this type of spirituality. Unfortunately, as I stand here, what leaves or what is left of us is just a shell of backslidden Methodists, nominal Methodists. It's not difficult to go to a Methodist church and you can confuse it for any other gathering. Methodists are lovers of hymns. At least we've sung some hymns today. But it's not surprising to enter a Methodist church and no hymn is sung at all. If you want to let me down, Bishop Mar Matumbi, take me to a service called Methodist and no hymn is sung. I'd rather sing... Mwamba wenye imara than Mwamba Mwamba a thousand times. Rock of angels cleft to me once would be more meaningful than repeating Mwamba Mwamba a thousand times as sometimes we do. For this reason, admirers of Methodism have taken up our hymns and they have perfected them and beautified them and sung them with passion and with purpose. And many of our members have gone away to where Methodism has been perfected. They have taken our scripture reading, the beauty of standing in the pulpit and reading the Bible eloquently and with authority, not just reading like a novel. They have perfected that art and their services become more beautiful than the owners of that spirituality or that tradition. They have perfected the art of preaching. No one stands carelessly in the pulpit with preparation, with those 
faithfulness, having visited the throne of God and the chambers of God and prepared themselves, preachers who are here, do not go anywhere to preach. If you don't preach everywhere you go, so said John Westry, they have perfected the art of lay preachers who fear nothing but sin. And our Methodists are trooping towards those churches. If you think what I have just read is strict, go to the internet and look for another document by John Westry called The General Rules of Methodism. It's right here in your phone if you have some internet. The General Rules is so strict for the definition of the people called Methodists. In that document, Sunday is not just the two hours that we come here, 10.30 to 12.30. To it is the full day, and that's how I was brought up, knowing that honor the Sabbath was not just what is written in the bold. First service, 8.30, second service, 10.30. It was not just that. Sunday, the Methodism tradition that was passed on to me was a day of reverence. Methodists never opened their shops Methodists respected God. They were not involved in any profanity on this day as they sought God for strength to cover the other six days in the week. The general rules of Methodists forbade even using of many ones in selling and bargaining. Kenyans know what I mean. <laughs> not my ones. Google that document, it will tell you. It forbids the general rules, the selling of liquor or the taking of liquor. Although it says in very extreme cases, Methodists can use liquor, maybe the Holy Communion. <laughs> As I stand here today, I look at the liability we have invested upon Methodists by not giving Methodism the benefit of a people called Methodist, a people purified, a people after God's own heart. No wonder our story is written in newspapers in bad color. No wonder our story is narrated by people in, in, in journalism in bad light because we have not festooned. We have lost our heritage and I stand here to say the righteous cannot live by faith, the people called Methodists, until we recover our heritage. Methodists are different. We are not Presbyterians. We are not Sitam. We are not Anglicans. We are not long names with several adjectives. We are not any other. We are not Catholicism. We are Methodists. And there was heavenly intention that we should be called Methodist. Unfortunately, we have backslidden from what is called Methodist. We have so many nominal Methodists. Methodists are part of the people who sell soil for fertilizer. Methodists are part of people who are corrupt. Methodists are part of people who block the roads when there's a small accident and overlapping is not a new vocabulary to Methodists. Methodists are indisciplined on the roads. Methodists here, Methodists here. I don't want to mention all of them because I can see them even before our presence this day. And therefore, brothers and sisters, we must recover our heritage. We must check ourselves keenly. We must check the people we admit into the ministry. Who are the clergy in our church? Are they people after God's own heart or are they people after power? Are they people after money? Are they people after the allurements of the world? Are they people of strange sexualities? As you're talking of strange sexualities in our days, are there people 
of corrupt nature that we admit into the ministry to be our shepherds, to help us look at Christ as they look unto him. We must check the people we admit into our leaderships. We must check the people who sing before us in the name of choir and worship. We must check the people who usher us in. I did a standing in one of the African independent coastal churches. Those churches you see very funny with flags and funny dressings, but those churches are very serious. Before we entered the service, they sniffed at us, literally using their noses to feel if we, if we have any sin. <laughs> Those were the ushers at the, at, the, at, the, at the door there, sniffing for any Aryan category in their spirituality. And so, as you stand there as an usher, we must check the people who usher in our systems. We must check the type of offertory that we receive, that we may not receive strange offerings. We must once again be strict as Methodists and be strict in our spiritualities because a backslidden, a nominal Methodist is a liability. A nominal Methodist is a nominal husband, is a nominal wife. Is a nominal spouse. Is a backslidden spouse. A backslidden Methodist is a backslidden child. Is a backslidden everything and is a liability to the society of the people called Methodists in the nation at large. We must check ourselves once again so that we can go back to our roots. So that as we lift Christ up he will draw men and women unto himself. It will not be astronomical science to fill in this church. It will not take much effort. The effort will, it will take will be the effort we take on our knees and in our prayer times and in the crying out unto God. Where God is lifted up, automatically he draws people unto himself. We kindle a fire that cannot be ignored in this Ruaraka. We raise an altar. We raise a spirituality that cannot be ignored in this village because there's something happening in the house of the Lord today. And as I look at ourselves, I see so many Methodists who are nominal, so many Methodists Bishops who are backslidden, a backslidden Methodist is a backslidden bishop, is a nominal Methodist. We don't know where we're going, where we're coming from. Things like Holy Communion becomes just like another ritual, another, another something we must do. We forget the sacrifice of Christ on the cross and how he cried, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakidani, and how he said it is finished. We forget the sacrifice of Christ. We forget his love for us. We forget that we have been forgiven. We have been redeemed. We forget that our original nature, which has fallen, has been restored. We have covered, recovered the image of God, Imago Dei. And the ones of Nicodemus this morning are very instructive. The vocabulary of born again must once more inform our spirituality. Nicodemus was not just a lazy person, was not just an idle person, was not just a person attracted to the phenomena of Jesus. Nicodemus was a serious, stable person. He had achieved everything a man could achieve in his society. He was honored and respected. And he comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, I have observed you. You have something special. I've come to you. How can I be born again? And Jesus tells him, How can I live again? Jesus tells him, You must be born again. The language of born again must once again be spoken by the people called Methodists. Look at Nicodemus, John chapter 19, from verses that 7 to 39. 
John recounts to us that together with Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus participated in the burial of Jesus. So from chapter 3, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, right to the end, when his disciples were falling away, Nicodemus takes up the body of Jesus together with Joseph of Arimathea and he participates in the burial. It was not an idle question. It was not a waste of time when Nicodemus went to ask Jesus about life. And Jesus told him, you must be born again. You must be born of the water and the spirit. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You must be anointed. And this anointing carries Nicodemus all the way to the end of Jesus' life. This language of born again, this vocabulary that informs our faith must once again be present in our conversations. Did I tell someone about Jesus today? A question by John Westry. And for John Wesley, born again was a recovery of the lost image that Adam and Eve lost. For John Wesley, anything born of the flesh must be born of the spirit. Otherwise, it has not recovered the lost imago Dei, the image of God. John Wesley was very, very straightforward when it came to matters of being born again. And he said these ones, and I want to paraphrase them the way he said them. He said that either the Spirit of God convinces us that we are children of God, or he convinces us that we are children of the devil. There are no two ways about it. If you are born again for justice, you must know. So a Methodist must know if they are born again or be convinced by the same spirit if they are children of the devil. I want to invite Methodists to listen to themselves and to check themselves and to self-examine themselves and know if they really meet the criteria of the people called Methodists. Isaiah, I take him as a Methodist, says that he lives among a people of unclean lips. If you go to chapter 5, before we read chapter 6, Isaiah has six woes. Oh, unto them who do this, oh, unto them who do this, oh, unto them. And the category of sin is multiplied. The people who live in darkness mention any sin. And Isaiah tells us that it was present among those people. And he was daily troubled about this sinfulness. Until he went to the temple in the day or in the year that King Uzziah died. And he saw the cherubims and the seraphs. He saw the glory of God. He saw the holiness of God. He saw how people should live who have been redeemed by God, joyful in their hearts, forgiving, loving one another. He saw a picture of how the presence of God transforms a society. And he says that in that moment, a cherubim flew and touched my lips and cleansed me because I lived in the people of unclean lips. And at that moment, when God asked the question, whom shall I send? Isaiah exclaimed, here I am, Lord send me. So therefore, brothers and sisters, the category of Nicodemus, because the Bible does not present to us just as an individual. It represents a category. The category of Nicodemus must once again be found in our gatherings. The category of Isaiah, who stand out in a sinful nation, must once again be reclaimed in our gatherings as the people called Methodists. We cannot perfectly fit into the category of people who are living by faith. Believers living by faith. Righteousness living by faith. We cannot stand confidently in that space unless 
we have that experience of calling upon the name of God, recovering our sinful nature, the Adamic nature that was lost, recovering it again, being convinced that we are the children of God. We cannot recover that until we call upon the name of God to purify us and to purge us. Judges chapter 2 verse 10. If you can show us Judges chapter 2 verse 10. It's a scripture that has struck me and has challenged me. Is it verse 10 or verse 12? Yeah, that's verse 10. Verse 10. Judges chapter 2 verse 10. Let me read it from my version. I think it's the same version. But I can see it better. After that old generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. As I measure my Methodism, as I think about our church, I am troubled daily, Bishop Matombe, I am troubled daily that we may be raising a generation which doesn't know the Lord, who doesn't know Methodism. We are adulterating our faith so much. We are adulterating our Methodism so much. We are adulterating our spirituality so much that we may be guilty of raising a generation. A generation is not a small thing. Can you imagine what Judges is telling us? A generation, so the many years, who never knew, akwa mungu or anything that belongs to God. A full generation. People that are years old, people 40 years old, who do not know God. And it can actually happen. This verse, the consequences of this verse, are possible and we can be herons we can be partakers or people who give birth midwives of such a generation far be it from us god have mercy upon us that we are not participating in bringing up a generation that doesn't know methodism doesn't know christ doesn't know even a wonder about John Wesley and how he labored and how he went 40, more than 250,000 miles on horseback preaching the word of God. How he was strangely warmed in his heart. How he preached as a pastor without being born again until one day his heart became strangely warmed. May God help us. May God have mercy upon us. May God quicken our hearts so that we can be true Methodists and therefore we can pronounce ourselves a people who are living in righteousness. Shall we stand up as we pray together, church? As we stand in the stillness of this presence, I ask you this question that has troubled me. Am I really a Methodist? Am I truly a Christian? Do I know the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? Am I born again? Have my lips been cleansed? Even as I live among a people of unclean lips. I want to see the vision of God as I stand here. I want to see Jesus Christ highly and exalted. I want to see the Lord exalted in his holy and mercy seat. I want to see Jehovah. I want to see Jesus Christ restoring the fortunes of Methodism. I want to see Jesus rekindling a fire 
in the vision of John Wesley are people who fear nothing but sin. I want to see the traditions of Methodism relived again in my generation. I want to worship God as he has called me. Umeji umbia Malaika waku abudu Naungana nao nasema uabudiwe Umeji umbia Malaika waku abudu Naungana nao nasema uabudiwe 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 Naungana nao nasema uabudiwe Buwana uabudiwe Ooh, I'm